Welcome back. Now being joined on the program by retired group captain Sadiq Garbashehu, a former deputy head of security at the African Union and private security and defense consultant. He joins us on the program uh, from Abuja to shed more light on this whole issue of Boko Haram surrendering and the difficult road ahead in terms of reintegrating them into society. Thank you very much sir, for joining us on the program. Let, let me get your take on this issue of uh, the Boko Haram and ISWAP fighters now surrendering. Uh, what, what do you think is making them give up the fight? Thank you very much. Um, what we are seeing happening is an interplay of several factors. But the chief among those factors, when uh, an insurgent group decides to surrender or come out and drop their arms, it must be the operational pressure that is brought to bear on them by the armed forces of Nigeria. But that is not the only reason. I say it is the chief reason. Other reasons might include internal dynamics within the group, we know uh, Sheikha recently died, and definitely there are people that have lost as a result of uh, his death, and there are those that have ascended to positions. So there is a group dynamic between that. Apart from that also, since the advent, uh, this, our neighboring countries, you know, realized that the issue of Boko Haram is not only Nigeria's uh, problem because they have started hitting mm. them. Almost every country now is up to protect its own side of the territory. So... Uh, 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 as uh, related to 2011, 2012, or 2013, where Boko Haram can easily move from one country to another, now they do not have international sanctuary. An insurgent needs sanctuaries where he can hide, where he can hit and move. That has gone out. The third aspect of this uh, leading to this defection is also the issue of cutting up of uh, logistic lines, whether it is food, whether it is uh, fuel, whether it is transportation. An insurgent group is also a human being. They need all these things to survive. So if you can find a way of cutting this thing and cutting finances, definitely you will put pressure on them. And uh, the other aspect, the other factor is the factor of time. No human being wants to fight, you know, continuously for many mm -hmm. years. Experts are unanimous that after, on the average, after studying over 69 insurgencies in the world, that generally when an insurgency is about 10 years or just past 10 years fatigue will set in so definitely all those factors will be will be will be coming into effect and that is what is making us to uh, you know to see this uh, spate of uh, surrenders and uh, defections from uh, boko haram no. however mm -hmm. it is important whatever reason may be the reason for going out one important thing we should not forget is that it is a good sign because as long as we have more numbers of Boko Haram coming out, the numbers that are joining them, then it means we are coming towards the end of the conflict. But that is not to say we are yet there, Uhuru, but it's a good sign, and uh, experts are unanimous, that high rate of desertion, high rate of uh, defections, are all uh, indicators that the, insurgents, the insurgency has reached a tipping point. And if uh, pressure will be mm. maintained, all things being equal, Definitely, they will, they will, they will, they will give no, up. No. Uh, I, I, I always like to explain the difference between defection and desertion. The ones that we are saying coming over to, to, to Nigerian forces, you may say they defected, they changed side. But I can assure you that apart from those ones that we see on TV handing over, there are also deserters who will just get tired of fighting, throw away their weapon without necessarily surrendering to the armed forces and then melt into the local communities. Uh, and, and, and now let, let's talk about this um, defector, so to speak, the ones that are coming out that we're seeing on TV and all of that. Um, do, do you think we're really prepared for, 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 for them? Do you think we're prepared to receive them, even though we're receiving them? Because you, you listen to some of the, the, the things that have been said, even by the Borno State Governor, you, you know, recently saying that... Um, he is not uh, absolutely sure that uh, reintegration will be uh, that smooth be because um, the victims of uh, the insurgency, of course, are there in the society. And he's not absolutely sure that th they'll be willing to just forgive and accept them into society. So, so the question is, do you think we're prepared you know, to do this process of rehabilitation and uh, reintegration? A and then how can we be absolutely sure that these people who are coming out are genuinely repentant? Uh, thank you very much. The rate of, uh, of uh, defection and surrendering 
actually caught everybody by surprise, even though we were hoping it would mm. happen. But the rate and the suddenness of it actually caught everybody off guard. So definitely, I will agree with you that uh, we may not have enough, uh, you know, uh, 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 mechanisms on the ground to accept these people. But then, as the situation is developing, I expect both the local government, the state governments, the local communities to take up, you know, responsibilities now of bringing, uh, of putting in mechanisms that will take us. Because if not, we'll have another problem. What do I mean by a problem? Uh, for it to, you have to think ahead of time. What do you do with these people? You have to process them quickly. And you, can, you have to house them. Uh, the issue of, uh, you know, uh, international humanitarian law, all of armed conflict, is that once somebody surrenders or you capture him, then there are certain obligations and there are certain responsibilities that you mm. must take. You must house those people properly. No matter how people feel, you must feed them. You must take care of their... If they have any medical needs, you have to take them. In fact, the, the requirements under Geneva Conventions are so many. You are even expected, if you catch a family, you are supposed to keep the family together. You are not supposed to separate them. And so on and so forth. So definitely, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to ensure that these people are taken back. So I expect both the federal, state, and local government, and even the communities, you know, they have to, they have to come together. Now, I must warn that uh, in such a situation, experts are unanimous. This is what we call a non-international armed conflict. It's not Nigeria fighting another country. Mm -hmm. Had it been it is Nigeria fighting another country, once the soldiers of one side surrender, all you need to do is give me my, my prisoners of war, take your prisoners of war, and everybody goes to his country. So that was the problem. But unfortunately, a non-international armed conflict like we saw during the Civil War, and this one, is very difficult. Why? Because the people you are fighting are citizens. There are certain rights that you cannot deny them. You cannot just wish them away. They are there. They have, no matter what they did, no part what they did, they still have links to their communities. They have marital links. They have blood ties. And you cannot uh, take them to another country. And at the same time, you have people who have been harmed, people that uh, kill their mm -hmm. husbands, kill their parents. They have to live side to side with them. However, uh, whatever decision the government takes, I am sorry to say there is no easy decision. There is no easy And in the end, it will be a compromise. A compromise between government, a compromise between those people who have lost uh, relatives, wives, children, and then the, the insurgents themselves that surrender. It has to be a compromise position. It's not easy. But in the long run, all these three groups have to do give and take. And uh, how can we tell that this, this uh, insurgents who are coming out now are, are genuinely repentant? Shouldn't there be yes, some that, kind of profiling that, and all of that? That aspect of your question, actually what is supposed to be done, as soon as somebody surrenders, each Boko Haram that surrenders has a history behind him. Without even investigating, we know there are people who willingly, adults, who willingly join the Boko Haram and even encourage others or stole others to, I mean, uh, abducted others to join Boko Haram. We know there is that group. There are also groups that we are not Boko Haram, but they were abducted by force and taken into the bush. There are ladies that were abducted, not out of their own free will, not out of their own free will, taken into the bush and converted to wives or sex slaves. There are children who were 10 or 11 years who were taken into the bush and they grew up and become adults and for no, uh, you know, for no choice, they joined the Boko Haram. So you see, each of these groups, they have their history. So what is supposed to be done? As soon as somebody comes, investigation is supposed to be into each and every person that comes out. And then each according to his deed, like they say in the scriptures. You look at those ones who entered willingly, who must have burned villages, killed people. Those ones, they are the, they are, they are the worst offenders. And you have to think of criminal justice system to deal mm -hmm. with them. However, children like uh, the, the Chibo girls, like the Debchi girls that were taken and converted, definitely you know they themselves they are victims. Children that were 9 or 11 years and taken into the bush, you know they are not responsible for their actions. So you have to look at these things and then for each person, it will be a graduated kind of treatment you will give according to what he did or he did not do. Now, um, how important is this process? Because the truth is that if, if we do not manage this process very well, it could also send a signal to those uh, who are still in the group and, uh, you know, are hoping to, to, to lay down their arms because 
there's no question that there just might be a situation where some that are still in the group are, are looking to see what is going to happen to those who have surrendered. And depending on what happens, uh, they, they will then decide what action to take. So, so how crucial is it at this moment in terms of handling of uh, this uh, situation now so that you know, you're not sending a wrong signal and then you're also not sending a wrong signal to the victims that uh, you're not going to do anything at all about those who, as you have said, willfully joined uh, the, the group in the first place. Thank you very much. Honest as the stage we are, I really sympathize with Governor Zulu. I sympathize with the show of Borno and other traditional rulers there. Like I said at the beginning of this interview, there is no easy decision. It's very easy for somebody to stay don't ask i mean who is not concerned who is not from that community to say don't accept surrender don't accept amnesty just deal with them but it is not as straightforward as that you have to balance peace and justice definitely the people that were you want peace that is the end of the war but you want justice for people who were killed by boko haram or their families but again at the other hand you also have to post, you have to balance justice and reconciliation so there will be aspect of forgetting and forgiving and there's also aspect of uh, punishment. All these things will have to be mixed into the box. There is no easy decision. Again, like you said, how you treat these people, it will determine how other Boko Haram people will go. So definitely you want that to happen because that will be the end of the war. But at the same time, again, you don't want to encourage impunity that somebody has done something and nothing has been done to him. So it's a very delicate balance. And that's why the concept of uh, restorative justice comes. We have seen restorative justice in... Uh, places like uh, Uganda, where they have the gachacha, the process they call the gachacha. We saw it in uh, Rwanda after the genocide. Restorative justice uses different elements. The victims and the perpetrators, you have to find a forum where they will come and talk honestly among themselves. But still, that does not mean they are made punish there will not be punishment. The people that have done the grievous of crimes among the Boko Harams, you have to punish them. But at the same time, like I said, you want restoration. Almost, unfortunately, almost all these Boko Harams, the people they killed more than anybody are people of the Northeast. I'm not saying they didn't kill other people, but that mm. is the majority of the victims. And they also came from that side. So when you leave them, now, even if you take somebody and take somebody to court, it's not uh, automatic that anybody taken to court will be given mm -hmm. death sentence or given life sentence. So even if he serves three years or five years, it means he will come out. And once he come out, under Nigerian law, under international law, you cannot tell him not to go back to Borno State. You cannot tell him to leave Nigeria. So you are still going to have that problem. So we have to look into the issue of restorative justice, borrowing in what happens in other countries, and then adjusting it to our realities. But there is no easy solution. But my own, uh, I will use my humble voice to appeal to all the stakeholders. They really have to sit down and strike a balance between justice and peace and then justice and rehabilitation or reconciliation. It's very necessary. There's nobody who's going to get everything he wants. The Boko Haram are not going to get everything they want. The victims are not going to get everything they want. The communities are not going to get everything they want. Federal government, state government, they are not going to get everything they want. Like I said, it's only somebody who is not from that area, who is not involved, that can stay and take a very hard decision and say, I'm not moving. But all the other... All the other stakeholders, in the long run, you have to give and take. And then what we are going to get may not be the best, but it's a compromise solution. And, and the truth is that um, th there's just no price too high to pay to, to, uh, to, to, to bring this war to, to an end and uh, to, to bring peace to, to that part of the country. Exactly. That, that is the point. If we continue to have this peace, I, I, I don't have the figures, but you can imagine you know, the amount of money that federal government is spending on this war. You can imagine the amount of money that uh, Borough State is spending on this war, even though we know the life of a human being does not have a price. But the issue is as long as this war comes, I mean continues, school, development, commerce, will still have to take a back start. So all these are the issues that, uh, you know, bad as it looks, I'm always, uh, you know, emphasizing to people that you cannot close any alternative and say this one is not acceptable. There's a compromise that all the stakeholders have to take for progress to be made. Finally, let me ask you this. Do, do you think uh, with, with this recent development now that we're moving closer to the end of this um, 
insurgency. Like I said at the beginning, uh, there are experts who have dedicated themselves to studying, even before Nigerian insurgency started, how do these insurgencies end? There are four or five ways that insurgencies will end. First, you could end up killing all the insurgents, but that is hardly realize, realizable. In all the insurgencies in the world, I think it's only in Sri Lanka that you can say the armed forces were able to uh, emasculate. But even them is not over because after signing of the surrender, there were still flashes of attacks here mm -hmm. and there. The next uh, possibility is what we are seeing now. That is the insurgents get tired and then they start surrendering or defecting to such a level that Boko Haram and Iswa will have few members and it can no longer continue the insurgency. The third one is the one we don't hope for, and it, but it has happened in other countries. It's where the insurgents eventually empower the government, I mean uh, overpower the government and take over. Now, out of all these three uh, possibilities, we can see the one that is happening now is surrendering. And that is how insurgencies normally end. And as long as the insurgency goes, the government always has the, I mean, the advantage on its side. Because government has the resources to fight and fight and fight for many mm -hmm. years, even though it will also be wasting the resources. But insurgents can only last up to, so far, I mean, uh, up to a certain uh, timeline. Retired Group Captain Sadiq Garbashehu, a former Deputy Head of Security at the African Union and Private Security and Defense Consultant. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. And um, as always, thank you very much for your time. It's a pleasure. Thank, thank you, you Sam, so much, sir. Well, that's how much we can take on the program this week. We thank you very much for watching. I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.